I'm Steve Brule with Studio Brule, and I'm here at the first international conference on men's issues in Detroit, Michigan, with uh, famous Dr. Warren Farrell, uh, author of eight novels. Is it eight books now? No, yeah, nonfiction books. Some, some nonfiction. Pe some books. people would consider them fiction, but I consider them <laughs> nonfiction. <laughs> And the, I guess the, the book that made you initially most famous was The Myth of Male Power. It's actually the Why Men Are the Way They Are is my best-selling book, but The Myth of Male Power had the, has probably had the most impact and probably the one that has had the most translation into uh, changing lives has probably been Father and Child Reunion that got many fathers involved with children that did not otherwise think it was that important for them to be involved. Okay, and Warren, you were here uh, giving a, a lecture just uh, uh, maybe minutes, minutes ago, ago <laughs> at this conference. And uh, how did the lecture go, and what was the main thrust uh, point that you wanted to get across to your audience? Well, how the lecture went seemed to go very well in the sense that it you know, got a very nice standing ovation and stuff. Um, but you know, I'm always suspicious of people that uh, come to me. They usually the ones that don't like something uh, don't come to you, and the ones that do say you're you're wonderful. Uh, so I'll leave the um, evaluation of the presentation to others. Um, but the the thrust of it was I was looking um, rather than sort of critiquing feminism and saying what was wrong with feminism, where it had gone off. off off, um, off its base and made a transition from equality to politics and political consideration um, consider, considerations. Um, I focused on the 10 major issues that I felt needed to be addressed and why those issues were so important psychologically and in terms of helping people understand uh, what, the, what the larger issue was. So for example, I looked at the boy crisis and one of the reasons that it's so important to focus on the boy crisis is that boys are doing terribly. In, they're doing terribly um, educationally, economically. Uh, they're doing terribly in terms of physical health and mental health. And this is happening all around the world. Uh, so I explained a little bit of that. But I also explained that boys' issues are so important because, for example, when we talk about a men's issue, say somebody says, um, I fear I'm a man and I fear rejection when I ask a woman out. Well, what, what happens for a woman when she hears that is she flips into all the times that uh, a man came on too strongly for her, to her, that overwhelmed her, that manipulated her with drinks. And she has very little empathy for the guy that says, you know, um, I felt uh, an experience of rejection because she wants him to hear her experience of being um, ignored and uh, the insensitivity of so many guys. And so, um, but when she hears this from a boy's perspective, and she's a mother, and she has a son, and she sees her 15-year-old son being really afraid to call a girl that he's really attracted to, she tends to be uh, saying to herself, she tends to be very protective of him and want him to really feel the importance of not being uh, rejected. And, um, and so she suddenly understands these issues from her son's perspective. So in brief, when we discuss adult male issues, adult females are programmed to want protection from men. But when you discuss boys' issues, adult females who are mothers want to protect their sons. So the instinct goes from resistance because I want protection from a male. I don't fall in love with whining males. I fall in love with alpha males. I fall in love with men who are willing to protect me. I don't want to hear, have a man be talking about, um, be preoccupied with himself. Men who are preoccupied with themselves and their own feelings are not usually likely to be protectors. And so the reason for the importance of boys' issues is to have uh, people be have their, their protector instinct um, drawn out rather than their resistance to men complaining drawn out. Now, does this continue into adulthood for mothers of their adult sons, or do they um, make a transition with their sons as their sons become adult males? Now, it's a really thoughtful question. Um, as, boys get old, as boys get older, uh, mothers still have a strong protective instinct to their, to their sons. So if their sons um, have a divorce, for example, and the woman in their life is really um, complaining about them, 
well, there's part of a mother that will recognize those complaints from you know, her son, but also the complaints about the son are in some ways the complaints about the mother and the parenting. Um, so there's a little bit of, you know, um, protection of the son in relation to I was sort of partially responsible, at least, for the outcome of the son. But there's another part that she's, you know, she, all her life, her oxytocin, her, her nurturing, cuddle, desire to protect, care for, uh, empathizing um, hormones are active in relation to her son. Was this the, the main thrust of your talk today? And what, what of your books deals most deeply with this particular issue? The uh, boy crisis is dealt with largely um, in the book that I'm going to be um, um, publishing in about a year uh, from now that I've been working on for the last four or five years. Um, it'll be called The Boy Crisis and probably subtitled um, From Failure to Launch to Mission Accomplished. Um, but so many of the issues that I deal with with boys have been um, are the issues that I dealt with in the myth of male power. Um, but those issues in the myth of male power were expressed from an adult male point of view. And they're also the issues I dealt with in father and child reunion. But they were oftentimes the issues that, that fathers um, didn't realize how um, important their involvement was. And fathers, for the most part, don't realize that their roughhousing, for example, is not just playing games with the kids. It's building alliances with the kids that they can then translate into using that, that alliance like a coach uses an alliance. And, um, and then the child is willing to pay attention to uh, to the father, and it doesn't want to rebel so much against the father because the father is the ally of the child. The two of them are, are playing together. Uh, they're defeating. If they're, they're if the father's coaching the child, the father sees the, ch the child sees the father as someone who has helps him to defeat the enemy. So if the father tries to help the child understand how to defeat the algebra problem, or defeat the reading problem, or defeat the um, math or science problem, the, the father the child has an uh, already developed experience of the father as an uh, as a as an ally and is able to more easily take that in and see the father as a coach and so those are just a, a couple of examples that that I developed when I did the research for father and child reunion but they're also things that um, I'll be helping um, people understand when I do the boy crisis book so it I'm, I'm hearing that you demarcate quite strongly the the relationship between mother and son or, or child and father and son and I'm understanding that the you, you view the mothers as a nurturing uh, concerned relationship protective relationship and the fathers as a, uh, a sort of helping the child uh, the ally the friend the uh, the mentor uh, the teacher uh, helping that child move into the, the broader world. Would that be accurate? That's the overall pattern. Now remember, there are many mothers um, who are more like dads and many dads who are more like moms. Um, and interestingly, when a mom, you know, when a dad is very protective, oftentimes the mother becomes less protective because sometimes people, mothers and fathers, understand that the children need both. And so they start figuring out which, what role is most comfortable. But as a rule, um, a mother, for example, a child will come home from school and say, oh, you know, my teacher is terrible, I hate school, and stuff like that. And the mother will be more likely, more, more likely to say, I'm going to go in and make an appointment with the principal and talk with her about getting you or him about getting you another class, another teacher. And the father will say, you know, you have to learn to live with people that aren't very comfortable for you. And it's better you learn it now than you learn it after you get out of the world of work and you get fired. Um, and so, the, the, and those tensions are helpful. That's, they're what I call checks and balances. Um, and we all know on some intuitive level that, you know, that we, you may be liberal and hate, a conser hate conservatives or conservative and hate liberals, uh, but you sense on a deep level that the country is probably better because there's a tension between both conservatives and liberals. And you may, a father may hate a mother or vice versa, but the, the children grow up better when there is that tension between the mom and the dad in the family that leads to the children doing um, significantly better. We now know that the children do significantly better when they have both father and mother equally involved in non-intact families, when they have, um, when there's, when the father and mother live close enough to each other uh, that the, so that the child doesn't have to give up um, activities with friends or um, or um, or going to a birthday party of a friend um, in order to see the other parent and build a resentment that they have to go out of town and see the other parent um, on that weekend and, and miss the, the birthday party. Um, or they and, and the third thing that children need that that I talk about in father and child reunion 
is that they need to know that they're not here bad-mouthing from mother to dad or dad to um, mother. And the fourth thing that they need is, um, is the parents need to be in family counseling or couples counseling consistently, not just when and it's an emergency. When you have those four conditions met, children who grow up in divorce situations or otherwise a non-intact family, those children have a better chance, almost as good a chance as a child growing up in an intact family. Hmm. So it sounds to me that you suggested in, in, your, in your, your message there that uh, this interplay between mother and father, often if, if, a, if a mother is personally not inclined to be a certain characteristic, the father will often take on that characteristic, fill that gap, and vice versa yes. with the mother. So there's, there's a real dynamic that mm -hmm. naturally happens between um, healthy uh, adults' relationships. Usually. To trade off these, what we, we often talk about feminine ways and masculine ways, but when, of course, an individual is some alchemical mix of all those mm -hmm. things. Exactly. So people naturally, would you say people naturally tend to adapt to their partner to fill in uh, areas where their partner is not yeah, filling that, in? Yes. Two, th three things happen. One is that you know, male, female plays protector and male plays stretcher, let's say. You know, um, I know you don't already know this, but you're going to try it anyway. You're gonna, if you fail, failure is part of success. So that's the normal male-female dynamic. The other, the other one is, we you know, the, um, a very maybe powerful woman, she might marry uh, a man who's very supportive. And so, and she might translate that into the parenting relationship and sort of be, you know, very um, boundary enforcement oriented. And then the male sometimes will adapt and sort of be more nurturing in orientation. Um, now, we're seeing that a lot in society today. At least I've seen it in some of my friends where, mm -hmm. where the woman is more career oriented and, mm -hmm. and the man naturally uh, fills in those roles. But mm -hmm. but one thing I have noticed as well in a couple of my friends is that the men who take on, say, the the motherly role, stay-at-home mother, they've uh, expressed to me some problems uh, with being accepted in that role amongst, oh, in the community. Yes, absolutely. Uh, first of all, we should know that when fathers are in a single parent role or, the, or they have a weekend with the children, let's say, um, and say the, the child falls on a ski slope and cries. Uh, well, oftentimes, in, when the woman is right there, the, the child will go to the mother and the mother will nurture the child. But if the father is there and he's the only one there, oftentimes he will play both a nurturing role followed by, a, okay, you can still get up and ski again now that I've given you a chance to express your feelings. Now, usually the father will let the child express feelings and cry for a shorter period of time, but nevertheless, he does play some dimension of the nurturing role. Now, you have other, another dynamic in many parents also, which is sometimes there's a dynamic of uh, the, both the mother and father being overly strict. And then the child may, will often become, the result will often be, become a child who's very successful, but there may be a hole in that child's psyche about, I'm, I am doing things that my mother and father both want me to do, but there's some part of me that feels I will not be loved, approved of, appreciated, or cared for if I don't fulfill in those things. So you have a, a child who's successful on the outside, but often insecure on the inside. The worst situation is where both the mother and the father overprotect the children. Um, the child that's overprotected um, usually does not learn postponed gratification. So the child that's overprotected, that's, that's, you know, that the mother and father says, let's see, uh, you can't have your ice cream until you fit, uh, finish your peas. And then the child tries to get a few uh, ice cream when it's only finished a few peas. And then the, um, and the child goes, um, and the mother and father go, oh, you know, we see that you've tried, you've had a few peas, okay, we'll give you your ice cream. Now, if the mother and father are both that way, if neither one of them enforces boundaries, then you have a child that never, that learns how to manipulate, as I was mentioning in my presentation today, uh, the child learns um, how to manipulate, maybe prepare himself for being a good lawyer, but he never has a chance to really assert himself um, and, and to, to really um, be successful in life as a rule. Uh, we were, you were going to say something about the workshop that you had here earlier. Is this something you do regularly and what was it about? Yes, uh, the, I do a few workshops regularly. One is I do a lot of experiential work. I find that people don't hear, you know, when, you, when you give people just information, there's only a relatively small period of time for which, um, they can, from which they can absorb that information and hold on to it accurately. 
but I did do a fairly lengthy, about an hour slide presentation, PowerPoint presentation. You can tell what era I'm from, slide presentation. <laughs> um, PowerPoint you presentation. You and me both. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> um, I did about an hour's PowerPoint presentation on the various dimensions of the boy crisis. So I looked at you know why there is a boy crisis and the, broad, the broadness of it worldwide. I looked at um, what the causes of it um, are, and I looked at what solutions might be. And then uh, we broke into um, uh, groups, and we talked about our dads and um, what the what created the glint in our dad's eye. And then I asked everybody in the group to sort of identify that and tell the stories about what the, they what allowed them to identify the glint in their dad's eye. And then I asked them to compare what they da their dad did for a living, like being an engineer. Uh, versus maybe the glint in his eye came when he played a musical instrument. But then I asked them to go to their family and, and make a decision, make believe they were their parents when the first child was born, and decide whether they think the father could make a living as an artist, a musician, writer of poems, player with children, and so on, versus being the engineer. And almost all of them conclude that um, if the father did what created the glint in his eye, he wouldn't have made enough money to support the family in relation to what um, uh, what he actually what he actually did for a living, and so that helps everybody in the family realize that pay is not about power. Pay is about the power you give up, the power you give up of the glint in your eye, the power that you give up to be with your family, the power that you give up to be fulfilled as, as an artist or a musician in order to get the uh, ability to have your children have more opportunities in their lives than, than you've ever had before. Um, and so the, the, when everybody realizes that in the room, it not only helps them appreciate their dad, but it also helps them realize that that men earn more money not because men have more power. Men earn more money because that they're willing to pay the toll of, of earning more money, that the road to high pay is a toll road, and that to the tolls are paid largely in the family by men in relation to earning, um, and largely in the, the, the tolls um, of taking care of the children in terms of changing the diapers and taking the ch you know doing a hundred other things with the children, those tolls are paid largely by women. But both men and women pay those tolls usually pretty happily because they believe that those that what they do for their children will make their children's lives even better than their lives. So here, um, dealing with men's issues, uh, Warren then we talked about uh, my own father who died uh, on uh, basically at the, the eve of his retirement after yes. uh, working for 20 years uh, unhappily to mm -hmm. provide for the family but in successfully to recover from bankruptcy. Um, do you see this in your own father or your own family life or other men that you'd like to share a story? Yeah, what I, what I see in like my own dad, um, I remember when um, he took a job uh, in Europe um, to um, to run a company, a Dutch company. He didn't speak Dutch, but they felt that he was a good enough manager to move him over there. And so he got involved in a totally different culture, learned Dutch somewhat well, um, and you know was uh, respected and um, and mocked by the Dutch workers who saw him as a outside, you know, uh, white male come. You know, well, white wasn't a problem, but American coming in there and sort of trying to run a Dutch company. And so, but he loved it, and he loved the challenge of it. Um, and um, but my mother was getting depressed living in Holland. She didn't like the rain. She she was away. From, she was much more interested in being with Americans than with, with Dutch women and Dutch men. She didn't feel she had any community neighborhood support, and she was getting increasingly depressed. And she would cry in front of even me. And I was only fourteen, fifteen at the time. And my father, of course, saw this, and um, and he said, you know, um, you know, sweetie, if you need to or if you want to. You move back to the United States, take the children with you, and I'll end my job here. And I will just phase out, give me a couple of months to phase out, and then I'll come back and I'll join you and Warren and your sister, um, and the sister Gail and brother Wayne. And, um, and so um, he did this. Um, and two months later, he came back, but he didn't have a job. Um, and so he was in his 50s. And so he um, couldn't find a job anywhere because people were afraid of investing in somebody who was so old and having to pay them pensions when they would only get the last years out of their work life. 
And so he ended up selling fuller brushes, which is something that if you're younger, you won't know what a fuller brush is. But if you're a little older, <laughs> you know that fuller brush salespeople walked around the street from door to door with a, a big case full of brushes. And the only thing they had to sell was brushes. And um, they were very good brushes, uh, but they were about three times what brushes normally cost. And so it was a little bit difficult to get people to buy those brushes. Very tough job. Uh, very to tough do. job. And he would make you know a fraction of what he made in, uh, in Europe. Um, and, and yet, to make a living, you know, he said to me one day, Warren, you know, I work so hard to, you know, climb the ladder, to do things I didn't want to do. I tried to have integrity in getting, going up that ladder. I often lost opportunities to get, because I had that integrity. Um, I then went ahead and I tried to, you know, work with a company that was very challenging to work with. Um, but now I'm coming back and I feel like I've spent all my life so I can walk around block by block selling fuller brushes. But he said, I'm happy to do that because I know if we don't have the money, you won't be able to go to college and you need to go to college. You're the type of boy that, you know, that you should be making a living with your mind. And, um, and so, uh, and your sister, I want her to go to college too because we don't know how the world's going to be and maybe she's going to need to have an income. And he had that type of foresight. And, um, and yet, and, and to this day, of all the management jobs he had, I respect him more for walking the streets selling floor brushes than I do for all the management, auditing, accounting, and things that he did at a higher level uh, road because that's where I really saw that he that, that was his way of manifesting love. That is a beautiful story, Warren. Uh, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, I know, I think this is a story that, that, that of my father as well. Mm -hmm. and. Um, because even through bankruptcy, he had seven children mm -hmm. and uh, worked long, long hours, uh, had to, to move to a new country in the U.S. Mm -hmm. For us, uh, for him, it was the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, and maintain the home back home in Ottawa and put, uh, at the time of bankruptcy, his three children in university mm -hmm. and still struggled to help with those bills and paid uh, at least uh, half of mine and, and uh, a lot of my siblings university while living alone in florida building houses uh, living alone living alone wow. in florida wow. um, building houses wow. he was he started with nothing down there he got wow. uh, a small loan from a, a bank bought up at the time you could buy a lot in florida for a hundred dollars yes yes and he bought up 20 lots was building 20 houses wow. at a time at the same time he got his real estate uh, uh, agent's license so that he could sell his own house to have mm -hmm. more money to, to pay back. Mm -hmm. He got his real estate brokerage mm -hmm. license, so he started his own brokerage, was building 22 houses at a time, living alone while sending. Wow, that's amazing. It, but know, it killed and, him. Yes, exactly. And, and we really have to share these stories. We really have to know that the world is not like feminists have painted it. That it's a patriarchal world where men dominated women. Men died because, for women. Women have to know that we love women. We will die for women. Even in my couples communication workshops, um, the first night, you know, the first night, very uh, maybe half the couples there. This is the last thing they're going to go to, and if they don't solve their problems there, they're going to divorce their partners. So here's a, a couples communication workshop with maybe 30 couples, and they um, and I ask them if you um, I ask them to write down on a piece of paper that will be seen by nobody. Um, I ask them if um, if your partner is about to drown, and you know that she or he is going to drown. But it's gonna. But you have a. You know that you instinctively feel that you have a fifty percent chance of dying yourself if you try to save your partner. Would you do that? Uh, would you take that fifty percent risk of dying in order to save your partner? And usually, about ninety-seven, ninety-six percent of the guys say yes. Even this woman, girlfriend that I'm about, and or girlfriend that I'm about ready to maybe divorce or break up with, I'm still willing to die for her. Now. About 70% of women say they would die for the, their male partner uh, as well. And so I use the purpose, that, that whole thing, not to show that men are more likely to do this for a woman, um, but it is important for women to understand how, you know, that, how men don't live their lives to exploit women. 
we would die to save women. We will die to care for women. If we see somebody, if you know, if I saw you raping somebody, I would risk my life to prevent you from raping her. You would do the same thing in reverse. That's what masculinity is about. Masculinity is not about exploitation. When people are sick or have psychological problems or are um, or they, they are out of control, then sometimes they deviate from masculinity and they do what um, is awful to women. Um, and certainly, this doesn't. You know, there is rape and there is uh, domestic violence, and it does go from male to female and, and rape and um, both ways in domestic violence. Um, so that no one should deny that. But that is not the core of what masculinity is about. Is about and to associate a patriarchal world where men made the rules to benefit men at the expense of women. Nothing could be a greater misinterpretation of what masculinity is about than that type of statement. Mm. And that, that is the, the norm that, uh, that men uh, will naturally go to if they're, they're, they are raised and grow into a healthy, full, mm -hmm. full male. Yes, if a, man, if a boy grows up with a dad and a mom, um, and is a is a healthy boy, which the great majority of boys with both fathers and mothers are, as long as at least one parent is into boundary enforcement, um, and another parent or both of them are also into demonstrating a lot of nurturance and caring. If the child has both of those skill sets and those both of those attention sets, um, that child will usually grow up healthy, short of some genetic problem, um, and uh, then then you're going to have a, a huge likelihood that, that uh, a, a boy will be very much oriented toward loving women in a healthy way. When I did an article once for Glamour magazine, I've never spoken about this but uh, before, but uh, when I did an article once for a Glamour magazine, um, they asked me to find out, to report on what guys um, most wanted from women when they were sexual with them. And they were expecting all these, you know, sort of um, tricky sexual positions, and um, you know, and uh, you know, orgasms, or you know, other things along those lines that we can all imagine. And um, and I so I interviewed guy after guy, and these were guys that were not sort of feminist males. These were guys from lots of different stripes in life, and they had lots of different desires, but they had only one thing in common, and one thing that was most frequently mentioned. Both what they had in common and what was most frequently mentioned was that they wanted the woman to be happy, excited, gratified. So I submitted this and explained and did the quotes and things like that. And Glamour said, we can't publish this. Are you kidding me? I am not they kidding would not you. publish it. They would not get publish it. That was not the answer they wanted. When was this? Uh, this Warren? was back in about the seventies, probably late seventies. Wow! I would have when I'm hearing you tell this. Mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking, geez, that that should be a, a really important article. They would love that. I mean, that you would think that they would love that. And this is not Glamour magazine is not a feminist publication, but this is you know this is the, even. How do you explain their rejection of this article? They want. They felt. How do you that, feel? Why I, do you feel? I feel that their rejection was basically. This is not what our editors, our managing editors, feel will sell. Women don't really want to hear that this is a very peaceful type of thing. It doesn't sort of like, um, women want to hear more like, you know, men want uh, a blowjob. Men want, you know, to be, um, you know, the, the, to have it be over quickly. Um, is it fair know. to say that, that, that what you found doesn't fit the narrative that's being promoted through the media for the last 30 or 40 years? Yeah, what I found does not fit the narrative. And, it, you know, it fits the, it doesn't fit the feminist narrative at all. At all. No. And what's happened is that so many editors of so many publications, even publications that like Glamour or Cosmopolitan that appeal to women, um, the, the, they still take this line. The exception to the rule actually has been Cosmo. Cosmo has been more um, politically incorrect in saying what uh, women really do want, and sometimes that means things like what I just said. Um, but even Glamour magazine, which certainly was not a feminist publication, would you uh, retry getting this published? Gee, that's a good question. I'm, I'm, you know, if if I had I mean, any, I think those results still apply today. They're yes, oh, I, universal result. I, I mean, I've started three hundred men's groups. I've started some two hundred and fifty women's groups um, all around the country, and you know, in men's group after men's group after men's group, there's I've never heard a man even intimate, intimate. Uh, that he and this is you know confidential groups where you know people open up and share their their heart 
and know that it will not get outside of the group. Um, and that's the big vow. And I've never heard a man intimate that he really wants to rape a woman. Uh, he, they, he might want to do a rape fantasy, you know, where the woman says she'd like to be overwhelmed and overcome. And you know, but, think, uh, but as long uh, yeah, as he as long that. as he knows she's part of the she's part of the desire, a willing, a, a, a willing, a willing right. let's do the just do a role play like that. A role play, yeah. But, it's, it's a but, game but at, at that exactly, point. As right? long as he knows that she knows it's a game, and she and she, and she and he knows that she can stop the game at any point in time, just say hold or something like that, then guys might be into that. But never have I had a guy suggest that he wanted to do something in sex that made the woman unhappy. Or that the woman didn't want. That the, yeah, that, didn't, that the woman didn't want, exactly. Right, yeah. This is fascinating, and it, and it, it touches on what um, Senator Cools mentioned yesterday. And she, she was very passionate in her, her lecture. And one of the points she made was that um, women would be surprised or amazed at how much the instinct to protect women is in men. Mm -hmm. It is such a travesty that feminism has morphed into having a monopoly on sexism uh, to a greater degree than any other institutional monopoly on sexism. When women's studies courses all over the world, industrialized world, preach that you know that men are really the oppressors and women are the oppressed, and the words oppressed, oppressed, oppressed is used again and again in any women's studies course. And if you think I'm exaggerating, just audit a women's studies course at any major university, the more the better the reputation of the university, the more it will be likely to be oriented toward Marxist feminism. And so, you know, I was on the board of directors of the National Organization for Women in New York City. I fought, fought for women's rights. I led demonstrations for women's rights. Um, I led demonstrations for the Women's Strike for Equality Day. Um, whenever there is a shortage of equality toward women, I'm out there wanting to make sure that that shortage is ended. Um, but to frame the entire male-female relationship in all of history as men desiring to exploit women, really, um, it doesn't just miss the mark. It is really a trauma to love. And and Erin talks about this as well, and she she actually refers to feminism as the evil empire now. Yes. And I don't know when in her life she she started to talk along those lines, but it it is starting to appear to me, and I've only gotten into these issues since interviewing you a year and a half ago mm -hmm. at the at where the the protest that becomes so uh, infamous <laughs> infamous right, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's. It's a narrative that of men are evil and men oppress for all of history. And it, it, it appears to me as, as if it's a deliberate lie. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's fair to say if it's deliberate or, 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 the, or the, the people who are spreading this to feminists are, are just uh, maybe not seeing the big picture. Uh, because when you, when even a little bit of history that I've been reading about, that does not fit. The big mm -hmm. picture of history of human history. Yes, the big picture of history that I've been getting to know more is men sacrificing, men working, mm -hmm. men building, men inventing, men providing mm -hmm. better lives, men vying for the attentions of women, not oppressing women, but trying to impress women. Absolutely, uh, all Absolutely. the time through of history. But um, maybe you could comment on on that. Is, is feminism deliberately uh, distorting history for? obviously for purposes of gaining some some form mm -hmm. of public support yes. or are they just not see, a, seeing the big picture um let's see uh, i think the best way to put this is imagine you are a mother and you um, are taking your child um, for a walk um, but you um, um, are um, a little bit concerned about the danger of bringing that child across the street so you might exaggerate how dangerous the street is because you feel like the means justifies the end. That, that lie, that exaggeration um, is um, for the protection of your child, uh, for, to, to achieve the larger desire for safety. And so I think what happened with a lot of feminists is there was a desire to, um, it was, it's a lot of means justifies the end. They sort of, they, they feel that if, uh, that women are um, not earning equal amounts of money to, to men. And so therefore, um, 
if they um, and if they they want the society to pay attention and to make sure that women earn equal amounts to men. Um, so they um, they look for data that gets society to pay attention, and so the data that is um, that is maybe accurate that maybe some woman in a job a certain job got passed over while the men uh, didn't and she worked longer and harder and she didn't they they glom on that example to prove that point and for them that becomes the metaphor that is the truth and so when they see other data that disagrees with that uh, they feel that the larger their larger mission is to get the society to pay men and women equally. They feel that is not happening, and they feel that therefore the lies are justified. And after a while, you don't even begin to see the lies. If I present information that says that women who have never been married um, out earn men who have never been married by 17%, and that the pay gap is not about the gap between men and women, but it's a gap about the gap between mothers and fathers and what happens when uh, fathers increase their focus on work when there are children and mothers divide their focus, focus between working inside the home and working outside the home. They don't want to hear that because they feel that I'm undermining their what needs to the bigger picture of what needs to be done, which is to straighten out the injustice for women not being paid uh, equally to men. And once you buy that injustice and you feel like your life is being spent to help people right that injustice, you feel that people like I um, and my statistics, I, that, that they're traitors, they're the enemy of writing that injustice. And so after a while, you begin to perpetrate, you begin to excuse the lies that you, uh, that because it, for you, the means justifies the end. So that's part of it. Another part of it is that feminism came into power uh, at a point in history where we had been through two basic movements, the civil rights movement, and then among intellectuals, uh, um, most intellectuals who were into gender issues were advocates of Lenin. Uh, and Lenin was, uh, said the family was terrible. The nuclear family was an abomination. It was an invention of the patriarchal system designed to dominate women and to serve men to their own self-interest. And, so, and, and then there was Marxism. And Marx basically said there are, are oppressors and there are, are then and there are the oppressed, and um, and so the oppressors are the wealthy and the oppressed are the poor, or the working class. And so they saw instead of they seeing the work instead of seeing the working class as being men, they saw the the rich as being men and women as being the poor. And so we had two systems that were institutionalized that both had dichotomies between the oppressor and the oppressed civil rights, slave owner, and the oppressed black person. And, um, and Marxism, the, um, the, the patriarchal dominating system, and the oppressed. And so uh, Marxist feminism, in, which is what dominates in the universities, fit the men into the oppressor and the women into the oppressed, as opposed to understanding that, that patriarchy was not the dominating force. The dominating force was the need to survive. And in the need to survive, both men and women did, did not have privilege. They did not, I mean, class was, classes had privilege. Classes had more power. But men and women were in the same class. The rich men had rich wives. They had children that had all the privilege and the power. And poor people had poor husbands, poor wives, and children that didn't have that privilege. So they, they, um, they missed the fact that in any given family, there's both the man and the female, the mother and the father are doing everything they can, sacrificing themselves with the hope that their children will have a better life. And that's what they did to survive. The division of labor, women working, working or overworking, often to death inside the home, men working or overworking, often to death outside of the home, as a warrior or as a worker, those things were sacrifices that, that, that both parents made. Feminists completely miss that. No, feminists still completely miss that. And that is, and the amazing thing is not that feminists miss that. 
all societies have ideologues who are blind to anything else but their ideology. The main thing is that that ideology has become um, adopted by virtually the mainstream, and that is, um, and and the media in particular, uh, and and the, much of the media has moved through women's studies courses, and the, that portion of the media that has interested itself in gender issues as part of what they write about as journalists, as part of what they write about uh, or do and produce in NPR and P PBS. Almost all of the people that write about and produce on these issues have that feminist bent, and it's extremely difficult to present anything that counters that. Mm, that's interesting, because the, the public then has been conditioned to to see this narrative and the media finds it easier to sell their product if it fits in the narrative that the, cub, the public is already prepared to receive. And I think yes. a famous Noam Chomsky talks in detail on this phenomenon of the media, right? Mm -hmm. Am I right in that? Yeah, Noam Chomsky talks exactly about that. Right. And, um, but even Noam Chomsky didn't get that uh, NPR and PBS are not selling that many products. They're public, you know, largely public. And the and what's happened is that the political liberal has bought the belief that um, men are the oppressors and women are the oppressed. That's an outgrowth that Marxist feminism is from the political left, and that has been absorbed by the political liberal. On the other hand, the political conservative uh, feels that the roles, you know, men should be men and women should be women. So they're not interested in a gender liberation movement. They're interested in women becoming real women and feminine women and men being real men and masculine men. And the masculine men should not question their gender. And, and, the, and the feminine women should be home, uh, whether she's oriented toward wanting to be at home or not. Uh, she should learn to be a lady and be at home. And so, the, so neither the political left nor the political right um, are interested very easily in a real gender liberation movement. Um, the political left defines liberation only from the female perspective um, and feels that men have no need to ask for rights. It's a little bit like I said in my presentation, um, men's rights is from the political left perspective, uh, like saying the king's rights. Mm, interesting. <laughs> Well, Warren, I want to thank you very much for spending this much time with me. Uh, your your words and your perspective is invaluable, um, not just to men's rights, but to human rights and to our society and culture in general. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge you, Steve, for you listen to me talk, you work the camera, but you at the same time are always thinking about what are the some thoughtful dimensions of my question that lead me to taking it to a deeper level for your viewers, and that's real service to your viewers. Well, thank you very much, Warren. I appreciate that.